Hello friends and welcome back to another session of Wheel Magic with me, your boy, Sean Shanson. Today we're making a return trip to the wonderful world of Japan-only PS1 games, where if the games aren't great, they're at least guaranteed to be a little bit weird. As always, we're going to take an extended look at three games chosen by the almighty Wheel of Games, and then one final bonus game chosen by you, the lovely viewer. So I hope you've been hungry for some cool Japanese games because the wheel's been feeling very generous and you better believe it will provide. The wheel will provide. Remember Beyblade? Well, it's back in PS1 form. Back in the glory days of my youth, pretty much all of my favorite cartoons were imported from Japan. There was this glorious period where you could turn on the TV and watch Pokemon, Dragon Ball, Digimon, Yu-Gi-Oh and Beyblade all in one sitting. And while Beyblade was my least favorite of the bunch, I still enjoyed it whenever it was on. I mean, considering it was a show about battling spin tops that could invoke the power of dragons and shit, you know, it had its moments. Plus, the team song is pretty amazing, so, you know, that's always a plus. Of course, where Beyblade really begins to shine is with the toys themselves. Collecting different parts and customizing your own Beyblade to your liking, it had all the trappings of any good kid's toy. Also, my local toy store used to host tournaments, and they were really, really funny. Blades would be flying, kids would be crying. It was hardcore. There's a lot of footage online from tournaments like that that took place in the early 2000s, so if you want to get a feel for what it was like, then I'd suggest looking some of this up, because it is gold. It's my best Beyblade because... Um, I'm working on this new move, and this move only works with this Beyblade. It's like the best out of all 12. And the move's called Waterfall, but I can't do it yet. Now, as you'd imagine, whenever a game comes out based off of a TV show that a kid likes, well, they usually want to try them. And thankfully, most of the time, the concepts and themes of these properties usually lent themselves well to video games. Pokemon obviously started as a video game, which helps, but a monster collecting RPG? Uh, yeah, it turns out that's a pretty good mix. Digimon World was also a lot of fun, even if it is low-key the most complicated kids game ever made. When you move a bit further down the pile though, you start to get to what I like to call the wonky anime games. Shows that have concepts that are perfect for video games, but end up kind of bad either due to some weird design choices like Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, or are just plain bad, like Dragon Ball Z Ultimate Battle 22. Then you have stuff like Beyblade, which in my opinion shouldn't really make for a good video game. The concept is just a little too limiting on its own. So. Normally, to compensate, this is where the developers would add some sort of additional fun gameplay layer, like a town to explore, maybe some RPG elements, anything to make the game more than just, you know, some spin tops booping off one another. So when I did eventually save up my pocket money and take a chance on the original Beyblade on the PS1, I was shocked to find out that it might actually be the worst anime game of them all. Not only is the whole game just crappy little Beyblade battles, but they didn't even put any effort into that part. It's one of the cheapest, low-effort games I had played on the PS1 and was severely lacking in the content department. A genuine waste of money. The only thing I remember fondly about the game is that it played the show's opening theme whenever you boot it up, and also the way the commentator says, What a great launch is really funny. What a great launch! What a great launch! 
So yeah, safe to say Beyblade on the PS1, not one of my favorites. But today we're going to give Beyblade a shot at redemption with its Japan-only follow-up, Bakuten Shoot Beyblade 2002, Beyblade Tournament 2. I'm just going to call it Beyblade 2. The game was both published and developed by Takara, who also worked on the previous game, and warning signs begin to shoot off from the second you start the game and see the same boy-girl avatars from the original Beyblade game. So the way this game works is that you pick your character, you pick a starting Beyblade from a selection of different choices, all based on iconic Beyblades from the manga and anime. Obviously we're going to pick Kai's Dronzer for extra cool points, and from there we get into the game. And would you believe it, this is pretty much the exact same game as the first Beyblade. It's got some different characters and Beyblades and one new arena type, but other than that, yeah, it's the exact same game. But Sean, what do you do in this game I hear you ask? Well, it's Beyblade. You fire a spin top into an arena and fight your opponent's Beyblade by booping into it a lot. The goal is to either outlast the opponent's Beyblade, knock it out of the arena or destroy it completely, although the latter is very, very hard to do. Outlasting a Beyblade gets you 1 point, knocking out a Beyblade gets you 2 points, and destroying a Beyblade gets you 4 points, and the first of 4 points wins a match. You do have a little control over your Beyblade once it enters the arena, but it's not quite full control. It's a little hard to describe, but imagine if there's some sort of centrifugal force acting on the Beyblades and you're kind of just fighting with that the whole time while you're trying to move around. It's not exactly bad, it's just a little unusual. You never quite feel like you're in control. Which I suppose makes sense since the point of real Beyblades is to just watch them go at one another until one of them eventually wins. But that doesn't really make for a good video game, so to make up for it you can kind of just influence its movement instead. Of course a big part of the animated series and what makes it entertaining to watch are the beasts that inhabit the bit chips placed inside the center of the Beyblades. These allow you to tap into the power of your beast to unleash special attacks on your opponents. Each beast has three different attacks and which attack you use is based on how high your special gauge is. This fills up from booping your opponent and then it's as simple as pressing the triangle button to unleash the attack. So yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. It is a very simple game and also really boring, but the main issue is that it also doesn't seem to work very well. For one, the AI is not very good and can oftentimes just outright lose immediately into a fight, and this happens way more often than it probably should. There's also times when just using your special ability can cause you to just lose outright as well. You can never really tell if anything is working as intended or if it's all just a bit random, but either way, none of it feels very good. Although things get even worse when you add the new arena type into the mix. This here is a Magna Core arena. They do have these in real life and they make the game a little more crazy and unpredictable by adding magnets into the mix. It's not my favorite way of playing, but they were fun to crack out from time to time. Well, in this game, the magnets make the game even more unplayable. I could shoot off out of nowhere, the AI could shoot off out of nowhere. Actually, the AI does this quite a lot. You could say it takes every problem the game already has and just magnifies it. So really the core gameplay is just pretty bad, but it's got more problems on top of that. Really its biggest issue is that the game has barely any content at all. The main single player mode is a repetitive tournament where you cycle through the only two arenas in the game and just earn some points and then you can spend these points to build your own custom Beyblade. But after beating the tournament just once, you can pretty much build the best Beyblade in the game. So unless you want to grind out inferior parts all day, your only other option is playing in a free battle against the CPU or a friend. But I mean, come on, who's going to play this with you? You know it's bad when the curling can't even make the game better. Also, the presentation is just a copy and paste from the previous game, which looked pretty bad already, but somehow might even look a bit worse in this one. It doesn't even have an opening theme this time, so like, What's the point? Look, I can't say for sure if Beyblade games eventually got any better than this. I know the franchise and toys are still going strong at least, so I assume they have. I do actually own two of the newer games on 3DS, but I only got them because they were going super cheap in a bargain bin in Germany and came with an actual Beyblade. I've actually never opened them, but after playing this, I don't think I'm in any rush to do so. So there you go, if you're a long lapsed Beyblade fan, or even just curious about how a spin top battle game might work on the PS1, well, here's your answer. Not very well. As I said before, the concept of Beyblades don't necessarily lend themselves well to video games as a whole in my opinion, but the shocking lack of effort here means it's even worse than you'd expect. So if you ever come across the original Beyblade in the wild or this Japan only follow up, do yourself a favor and just buy an actual Beyblade instead. You will get way more fun out of it. I promise. Three, one, go. Okay. 
の入ったクーズマン行け気合の入ったクーズマンお互い間を取っているぞとこれは運動が伝わってくるお互い間を取っているぞ何が起こったNext, we have Manichi Neko Yobi, which made its way to the PlayStation in the fall of 1998. So, how does everybody out there feel about cats? I, for one, adore cats. I'm not really a cat or a dog person, I kind of just like both equally, but cats especially, I just find really relaxing. Most nights before I go to bed, I like to wind down by watching a dumb cat video on YouTube. It's like getting a tiny, instant hit of serotonin. And thankfully, courtesy of Bandai, we have ourselves a game made for cat lovers. In Manichi Neko Yobi, you can experience all the trials and tribulations of owning a cat without ever having to worry about being woken up at 5 in the morning for absolutely no reason. The game itself is a simple cat simulator. It's not too unlike later pet simulations like Nintendogs, although what we have here is a little more simplistic than what you'd see in the DS days. A good portion of this game is pretty much watching a cat go about its day. You have a limited set of ways that you can interact with the cats. But for the most part, your cat really does whatever it wants, so at least your game is an accurate representation of owning a cat. Is the cat hungry? Well, give it some food. Your cat looking bored? Let loose a toy mouse. Want to make the cat hate you forever? Well, then try to give it a bath. <laughs> The game is broken up into individual days that take about 10 minutes in real time to pass, and throughout those 10 minutes, it's up to you how you want to spend your time with your cat. At the beginning of each day, you can select 8 different items from the local stores. The options range from different foods, toys, and vanity items for the cat. It seems like there's no cost to any of these, but the only catch is that you're limited to just 8. So you always want to make sure that you have a nice balance, and by that I mean don't overload on toys and make sure you have enough food to feed the cat. Because I don't want any of you feeling the extreme guilt that I felt for making that very same mistake. Your cat also has its own range of emotions and different stats too. Food can raise and lower certain bars, and the cat also seems to have a happiness meter. If you mess up somewhere, your cat may begin to sulk around the house and refuse to play with any of the toys. And once again, if this happens, you will feel terrible. Now, one thing I should probably get out of the way is that this is a pretty text heavy game, and as far as I'm aware, there aren't any guides or translations for it. Now, does the text really prevent you from getting into the game? Eh, not really. A lot of the menus and options are rather straightforward, and you can figure out a good 80% of this game just by spending a little time with it. Most of the actions in game are actually represented by images rather than text, and everything functions as you'd expect. Although, outside of the cat section, things become a little more tricky. From the get go, the game gives you a lot of options, and through trial and error, I kind of just had to figure out what these do. Some seem to give you options like purchasing your cat from a pet store or maybe choosing to adopt a stray instead. Some of them let you stay in a small one room apartment while the other gives you access to a massive four room house. There's also a ton of different food and item choices, but the differences between each of them and how they actually affect the cat,、uh, I couldn't tell you. And then there's the cat's various stats as well. Couldn't tell you about them either. Now, like I said, this doesn't stop you from having a fun time by just hanging out with your cat day by day, but it does grow old pretty quickly. After a couple of days, you tend to just exhaust all available toys and food, and you start to feel like you've just seen it all before. Although, according to the back of the box, this is just a part of the game. Seemingly, the real goal in Minichi Neko Yobi is to own multiple cats, which you can then breed to raise kittens and then enter your best cats into local competitions. Now, this to me all sounds very exciting, but. For the life of me, 
I could not figure out how to do any of this. Having just dicked about with all the various options, I could never find any way to adopt more than one cat at a time. I don't know if it's a time limit thing and you just kind of have to wait a certain number of in-game days, but in my playtime, no clear option ever appeared for me. I was able to access the contest page at least, but I was never eligible to participate in it. I would just get this message and unfortunately I could not decipher what I needed to do from it. I would have loved to see multiple cats interacting with one another and how the kittens mix things up. Sure, one cat is fun, but more cats equals more fun. Now even with those additions, I still think the game itself would remain relatively simplistic. The goal of this game is really just to give cat lovers a fun little cat experience on the PlayStation. It's got a ton of great encyclopedic entries on different cat breeds, featuring various chunks of information on each, and also a collection of photos of real cats too, which is kind of fun to see considering that these were taken way before the days that cats ruled the internet. Most of these were likely taken with real film cameras, so you know, that makes them extra fun. Plus the cat models look pretty good too, you've got a ton of different breeds and types to choose from, and once they're in the game, the cats have very very cat-like reactions to things. The models are quite simple, but they nail the feline personality and movements. It's always a fun time seeing what they're gonna do next. Of course, they also meow and hiss at you a bunch while this incredibly pleasant music plays in the background. I watch a lot of cat videos from Japanese owners and this game genuinely sounds the exact same as a cat YouTube video. Believe me, if you watch cat videos, you'll know exactly what I mean. So yeah, that's pretty much it for Benichi Neko Yobi, a very simple game aimed at a very specific audience. Quite simply, if you like cats, then you'll like this game. If you don't like cats, then you won't like this game. It's not the most complicated or content rich pet simulator out there and if you can't read Japanese like me, well, you may struggle to access some of the game's deeper features, but even then, as far as low poly cat experiences go, this one does a pretty good job of successfully capturing that feline magic. Even if that just means watching a cat lose interest in the brand new toy you bought it, and then hating you randomly for the rest of the day. I'm sure cat owners wouldn't have it any other way. <coughs> The wheel will provide. Next up we have Community Palm, making its way to the PlayStation in October 1997 and both published and developed by a company called Fill In Cafe. If that name doesn't ring a bell, well it's probably because they never released a game outside of Japan. But whether you know them or not, these guys were responsible for some of the PlayStation's most impressive 2D titles, most notably Panzer Bandit and the excellent Asuka 120% fighting game series. So Community Palm is another 2D title, only this time we have ourselves an action RPG. A really cute action RPG about witches and cute rabbit friends and also building towns. The core of Community Palm's gameplay is split into two sections. You've got your action RPG parts which play pretty much exactly like your Zeldas or your Alundras. We've got action, puzzles, dungeons, towns to visit and people's problems to solve. While you're out exploring on your adventures, you might also come across these little creatures called palms, and palms play a pretty big role in the game, as these guys can tag along with you on your adventure to help solve puzzles and also operate as a cute little attack squad. But if you don't want to put your palms in danger, another part of the game involves putting them in a little community village that they build themselves from the ground up. 
This also unlocks your shops and stat buffs as well. So look, as you can see, this is a pretty promising package. There's a lot going on in this game, but can I actually deliver on the promise? Well, let's find out. Now, first things first, the game does have a good number of text and story segments. More text than a game like Zelda, but maybe less text than a game like Alundra. Thankfully, everything is simple and straightforward enough that you can kind of pick up on the different story beats as they happen, but safe to say, if you can't speak Japanese, then the story is going to be pretty much a non-factor throughout your playthrough. All you need to know is that once upon a time, strange creatures fell from the moon called Palms. Now, the people in this world were unfortunately very cruel to them, but a little girl named Luru was kind to them instead, so they gifted her a magic wand. Luru then later decides that she wants to build a village for the Palms to live in peace, so there you go. Let's go out and save some moon friends and build them up a little village. Why the hell not? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the game's visuals, because even though this isn't the most technically impressive 2D game on the console, the visuals and sprite work in Community Palm are masterfully done. Characters and enemies look expressive and are full of personality. The run animation on Luru is just... it's perfection. The environments, dungeons and towns all look great too. Very few areas and rooms are copy pasted and there's tons of detail to everything. Plus the game uses this almost pastel style colouring which reminds me a little of Kirby's Dreamland Tree at times. It's a really nice game to look at and it all runs amazingly as you'd expect. One of the towns in particular has this lovely reflection effect with the water that's really quite impressive. The game also has a full day night cycle as well which changes the look of each environment too. It's clear this game was made by a developer who got 2D games and really the style used here hasn't aged a bit. It's a beautiful game all around. And guess what? The gameplay? Well, it's pretty damn good too. It's pretty much your standard hack and slash fare. Replace Link's sword with a wand and, well, you get the general idea. You can slash, charge up attacks to create a shield and release it for a strong attack, and even run about and engage with dash attacks. Of course, there's also a range of different magic abilities you can collect too, which not only allow for new ways to kill your enemies, but also allow you to progress through previously blocked off areas. Who would have guessed? It is a tried and tested formula and Community Palm ain't coming in looking to reinvent the wheel in this area, but that being said, this is one of the best action RPGs I've played in quite some time. Combat feels quick, responsive and smooth, your magic abilities feel powerful and even platforming in this game is pretty damn good too. You do have a whole map to explore and seek out various additional towns and dungeons, but the game manages to maintain a fairly linear flow throughout the majority of the game. It may seem like the world is quite big, but it's actually a little smaller than your average action RPG. Most of the new locations are gated off prior to you needing to go there, so this means it's very hard to get lost when exploring, and if you do end up exploring somewhere new, well, chances are that's where you need to be anyway. So your goal in this game should generally always be to find the next dungeon. Now, the dungeons themselves function once again very similarly to Zelda. They are multiple level affairs with treasures, magic, maps, door keys, and even a big chunky boss key to seek out. I wouldn't say the dungeons are as complex or difficult as a Zelda dungeon, but they are still really fun to play through. The mini bosses and bosses especially are really fun to fight. Some of these can actually be quite tricky, but they prove to be the parts that highlight just how good the game's combat really is. Plus they look really cool. One of them is even just a straight up ripoff of Earth's level. Yeah, it's a fun fight though. Of course, beyond conquering creatures at the end, most dungeons also have palms for you to collect. Getting these usually requires a bit of exploring or puzzle solving, but they are well worth it. When you collect the palm, the first thing you need to do is give it a name and then it goes into your inventory. Once you return back to the community area, the palm then begins to live there. Now the palms will bounce around here happily on their own, but to actually get them to contribute towards the village, you need to feed them. Enemies across the world will oftentimes drop different foods that you can pick up, and when you feed these foods to the palms, they begin to do different things. Some food might make a palm build a house, other food might make them train up their stats and abilities. Each food does something a little bit different, and each palm is also skilled at doing something a little different too. The more palms you collect, the more you can build. Some palms might know the secret to building a hospital, and the others a farm. Get more palms, feed them more weird shit, and just sit back and watch the results. It's the best. Now of course, palms aren't just for building, you can take a party of up to 3 different palms out with you on the field too. These little guys just follow behind you normally and are invincible to damage while in this state, but if you press the command button, you can then unleash them on enemies around you, and surprisingly these guys are pretty damn effective. Some enemies can only be damaged by palms too, so I suppose it is a good thing they're pretty effective. Each palm also has a special ability too that can be activated by bopping them on the head with a charged attack. These can be used for solving certain environmental puzzles, but they can also oftentimes be used to just wreck enemies too. 
Honestly, this whole game, it all just works so well. The action RPG sections that feed back into the town sections to buff up your squad of moon friends so you can take them out and find more friends. This is good shit. Also, the music is pretty great too. Community Palm has a very interesting soundtrack. It's very different from what I was expecting from a game of this type, but it is really catchy and very memorable too. Another big highlight of the game for sure. So look, this isn't the hardest game I've ever played, nor is it the longest, and the town building stuff maybe isn't as fleshed out as I'd like it to be, but really, that's all just kind of nitpicking for the most part. I get the feeling that this is meant to be an easier game, kind of like a nice relaxing action RPG for beginners. It's got enough technical depth to make it appealing to any fans of the genre, but at the same time, it's a very straightforward and welcoming experience to newcomers, plus the town building aspect just adds that extra layer of addictiveness to the mix. I think the only major problem that the game has is a, uh, what I'd like to call a me problem, the language barrier. Now while the story doesn't play a big part in my enjoyment of the game, there is a few times you will likely need to rely on a guide to help you get past some parts, in particular with some of the city building elements. Now thankfully there are written guides as well as long plays out there, so if you ever need help it is available. The good news is that from my experience, I'd say a good 95% of the game you should be able to make through without any help from a guide. I was able to play uninterrupted for long play times, only having to stop every now and then for advice, which usually came down to me using a specific item in a specific place. It's not one of those games that you'll need to have a guide open to hold your hand the whole way through, thankfully, but if you do plan on playing it, maybe have a guide to hand just in case you need it. Yeah, so I suppose it's safe to say I really enjoyed Community Palm. I genuinely put it on the pedestal as one of the best action RPGs I've had the pleasure of playing on the PS1. It's not the most challenging game out there, but it brings more than enough interesting elements onto the table to create a fun hybrid of action and sim. Plus, its gorgeous visuals and fun soundtrack really help kick it up a few extra notches as well. Also, as a side note, there seems to be two versions of this game, the original Community Palm and a budget re-release with a slightly different name. Although, similarly to Mighty Hits and Mighty Hits Special, these seem to be the exact same game despite the name change, so don't worry about which one you decide to play. So in closing, if you like cute video games, fun action RPGs, or town builders with moon people, well then this one is a no-brainer. Try it out right away, you won't regret it. Provide.
Volume 7's final game and viewer selection is running high. This game was added to the wheel by Larry Kowaska. A big congrats to Larry on being the wheels chosen. So in case the opening didn't give it away, Running High is a racing game. And I mean, did you really think we were going to make it through one of these videos without a racing game popping up? Come on, it's tradition at this stage. At the very least, Running High isn't your typical racing game. Gone are the vehicles and in are the hyper-powered bodysuits quickly propelling people across the track. Running High joins the illustrious crew of Micromaniacs and Running Wild in the PlayStation's library of runner racers. Can't believe that's two videos in a row where I got to talk about Running Wild. What a time to be alive. Now, Running High predates all those other games though, and might actually be the PlayStation's first runner racer. The game made its way to shells in April 1997, courtesy of developer System Sacom. And like most racers released during this time period, it is a very arcadey experience. Although, beyond the major difference, which is being on foot, can Running High offer up any interesting ideas to actually make it worth your time? Well, let's find out. So first things first, Running High is a single player only game. So if you were hoping to beat your friends in a 100 meter dash, well, sorry, international track and field is that away, pal. Now, once we get into Running High and enjoy its fancy UI, it doesn't seem like there is a whole lot of content here. At the beginning, we have access to six different characters to choose from, one of which is called Woody Winger, who I absolutely would have played the whole game with if he wasn't terrible. And on the track front, we've got a grand total of three tracks and all too familiar cipher arcade racers of the time. But hey, it's about quality, not quantity. So let's see how the gameplay fares. Now you might be wondering how a game like this controls. Do you accelerate similarly to a car in any old racing game? And the answer to that question is yes. Running high controls pretty much like any other racing game that you've played. Hold down X to start running, press the square button to brake, and you can drift by releasing the acceleration and then pressing it again while turning. So far, it's all very familiar, but at the very least, it's all done quite well. The handling in this game feels a little more like being on a motorbike than in a car. It's a little unusual, but once you have a race or two under your belt, you'll be taking even the toughest corners like a pro, unless you're playing as the characters with bad grip. Seriously, I found these guys almost unplayable. It's like trying to turn in quicksand. Just awful. Just stick with the characters that have medium and high grip and you'll be grand. Now, of course, being on foot, the game has to add a few extra gimmicks in as well. Each character has access to a few different abilities reliant on a meter that charges up when you reach high speeds. First up, you have an ever reliable boost that strength is dependent on how high the meter is upon use. If you hit enemies while boosting, you can knock them down, and in certain sections, it can also be used to activate a jump instead of a regular boost. I'm not sure if this covers more ground than a standard boost, but it looks cool at least. Another way you can use your meter is to attack your opponent. Each character has access to left and right melee attacks activated by hitting the L1 or R1 buttons. If you've ever played Road Rash, well, you get the idea. These attacks can be used as much as you like, and if you hit an enemy, you gain some meter, but if an enemy hits you, you lose some meter. Now, sometimes if you have enough meter full, you can perform a special vault attack over your opponents. This uses less meter than a boost, but does give you a nice lead over an opponent while simultaneously slowing them down. The activation of this ability seems to be somewhat random, but whenever you get a chance to use it, it's generally always worth your while. And really, that's about everything you need to know to get into running high. It's a little odd to play at first, but it is easy to pick up and the racing does feel good. Now, as you can clearly tell, Running High opts for a near future sci-fi team with its cool super suits and industrial inspired racetracks. The opening track Marquee Town is the easiest as you'd imagine, but it still offers up some tricky sections that teach you the importance of drifting pretty quickly. Don't worry too much though, as the game is actually quite forgiving if you hit off barriers, but still look, it's nowhere near as cool as actually racing well. Although it is pretty funny. The second track Highwood is a much longer and narrow track and a big bump in difficulty over the first. The place offers up a nice blend of idyllic countryside and darker industrial locations, and there's even a fun section that goes underwater. Although you'll probably be focusing too hard on not crashing to enjoy it. And finally, we have our third track, Terra Park. I really like the look of this track. It takes place in a big city at night, and the background here really stands out to me, especially even though it's very simple, I still think it looks rather striking. All in all, the three courses on offer, they're all pretty good. They each get a thumbs up from me. So the racing is pretty good, the tracks are pretty good, well now I suppose we should talk about the presentation. I mean, by now you've seen the tracks, the racers and the game in action, and I'd say on the whole, this is a nice looking game for 1997. Sure, it's got some draw distance and pop-in issues that are maybe a little worse than some of its peers, but for a game that moves as fast as this does, everything looks pretty good in my opinion. There's a lot of detail in the geometry and the environments, and there's some decent variety between the different track locales as well. Plus, the characters all look pretty great too. I especially like these cool portraits that appear for each of them in the menus. Not the best looking game in the world, but I think SATCOM did a good job here overall. 
Now on the other hand, something SATCOM did not do a good job on was the music, because they did an excellent job. This game has such a good soundtrack. I think the game has like seven or eight tracks that just play at random when you start a race, and they are all stone cold bangers. The best of which is the game's theme song, Running High, which is up there with some of the best vocal heavy arcade racer jams. Seriously, it's so good. Hey, So on the whole I would say Running High is a very good arcade racer, certainly not the best I've ever played, but the presentation and unique gimmicks and settings should make it worth a play for any racing fan. The major problem of course is its content, there's not a lot of it here, there's only one mode which is just to pick your track in a race, and there you have it. But I have good news everybody, Running High may be a game low on content, but it does have unlockable content. Running High actually gives you a reason to keep playing, because its best content is actually hidden behind an age-old ritual, having to play the game. So when I first started this game, I did what I would usually do. I tried to come in first in each of the available tracks. Now, I did this with three different characters, but nothing extra unlocked. So I thought maybe that was it. But it turns out if you access the proceed section in the menu, you can see all of the game's tracks and also your best position on each track for all six of the characters. So immediately I think, oh, I gotta be three tracks with one character, right? So I do that, and still nothing. Then I realise the game actually wants you to come first in all three tracks with every character, and that's what will seemingly unlock you the fourth and final track. And yes, that is what it wants you to do, but not only does this unlock the secret final track called Asteroid, which is pretty great by the way, and really hard, you also unlock reverse mode for each of the four tracks and a whole host of additional racers, including three new suit boys, but also a girl named Mary and even a baby. Honestly, I can't begin to tell you how much I miss dumb stuff like this in video games. Like nothing is better than playing as the Hornet and Fighters Mega Mix, you know? This is the same experience, running around a sci-fi racetrack, whacking guys with your purse or even racing against a whole crew of babies. This is the good stuff. Now look, it is a lot of effort to unlock all of this, but at least it's something to work towards and will keep you busy in spite of the game's low number of tracks. So it is a cut above a lot of arcade racers in this regard. Needless to say, I once again had a very good time playing this one. It's an arcade racer that does enough fun and interesting things to give it its own identity while still offering up some speedy high octane action. And while it's certainly nothing groundbreaking on the gameplay front, it doesn't really matter. How many games let you kick lads in the head at high speed while listening to amazing music? That's right, not many. So we need to make sure to support the games that do. And in this case, Running High is definitely one worth checking out. Well, was that enough rambling for you? I sure hope so, because it's time to wrap this volume up. Today we got to check out the worst follow-up to the worst anime game, a fun little pet sim for people who like cats, and going grocery shopping, a really enjoyable hybrid of action RPG and town sim that's also really, really cute, and finally a cool take on your traditional arcade racer with the kind of soundtrack that would give other games a run for their money. <laughs> run. As always, we need to slot each of the games into one of five categories. Is the game a must play? Is it something worth trying if you like the look of it? Is the game just kinda meh? Is the game trash? Or did I find the game unplayable due to the language barrier? Well, Volume 7 sees Beyblade 2 becoming the first Japan only release to make it into the trash tier, Manichi Neko Yobi and Running High making it into Tri tier, and finally Community Palm giving the must play tier another notch on its belt. Look. I like Beyblade. I've got nostalgia for Beyblade. If there was ever somebody who could enjoy this game, it is me. And let me tell you, it's not good. The gameplay is boring, the content is extremely lacking, 
As a package, it is just a dud all round. If you really need to play a Beyblade game, just make sure you avoid the PS1 offerings. Manichi Neko Yobi is a simple game that's only going to appeal to a very specific audience, cat lovers. But since I really like cats, I had a pretty fun time with this one. It's not the most content rich pet sim out there and be aware that the language barrier may cause you a few issues accessing some of the game's more fleshed out parts. But look, if you're the kind of person that really gets the appeal of owning a feline friend, then this one is definitely worth a look. Running High is a really cool game. While it sticks pretty closely to the tried and tested arcade racing formula, there's enough unique gimmicks to make it stand out from the crowd. Unfortunately, it still comes with the lack of content that does plague most arcade racers from this era, but the game at least offers a bunch of fun unlockables to really up that replayability. Plus, the soundtrack is up there with the best that the genre has to offer, so you know, check it out. Finally, we have Community Palm, a game that won me over pretty much from the word go. If the excellent 2D visuals and satisfying action RPG gameplay don't get you, then the fun town building elements, cute palm companions and weird soundtracks certainly will. It's not the most challenging or lengthy action RPG on the PlayStation, but it is a charming and varied experience that is largely playable with limited knowledge of Japanese too. It's a feel-good video game that can be enjoyed by pretty much everybody, and if you have the means to try it, well, then this one is a must-play in my book. So thanks, Wheel, that was a fun mixture of games, but of course we also gotta give a special thanks to Volume 7's winner, Larry Kawaska. A big thank you for your contribution to the viewer wheel. Now don't forget, if you at home would like to submit your choice for a game to appear in future volumes of the series, you can check out the channel update video linked in the information below for the rules and more information on how to do so. And finally, a big thank you to everybody who took the time to tune in today. You are the lifeblood that keeps this channel ticking, and also the wheel is spinning. If you haven't already, make sure to like the video if you liked it, and subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with future content. We're getting pretty close to the 1000 sub mark, and everybody knows that's the day you become a real Beyblade Master, so I'm looking forward to it. I'll see you all again soon in another video. Until then though, take care of yourselves, and don't forget to praise the wheel.